Recently, our client John met his banker to discuss plans for a clean energy building. What he found was a shared passion for building something more, momentum for change. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash John. Today's show is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Protect your online activity today and find out how you can get three months free at tryexpressvpn.com slash space. That's tryexpressvpn.com slash space for three months free with a one-year package. Visit tryexpressvpn.com slash space to learn more. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9... Ignition sequence start. Space nuts. Five, four, three, two. One, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us on yet another edition of the podcast we affectionately call Space Nuts. My name is Andrew Dunkley, your host, and with me as always is Professor. Fred Watson, astronomer at large, as against a large astronomer who obviously spends too much time behind the telescope eating Twinkies. Hello, Fred. (laughs) Um, I'm not familiar with Twinkies, but I did have a Twix today. How's that? That's close enough. enough. Any (laughs) any sugary treat you eat in bulk? (laughs) Well, I do. I tend to be a bit addicted to sugar, really. Uh, Aren't we all? (laughs) Aren't we all? I've seen documentaries about it. It's very scary. But I can't stop myself. No, we can't. Mm. Now, Fred, today we're going to talk about Voyager 2 because it's just crossed the threshold. It is yeah. now in uh, interstellar space or the interstellar medium, I suppose, to use the proper terminology. Uh, and we are also going to look at the um, what could be the lowest mass black hole yet discovered. This thing is small enough to get into a science fiction novel by Andrew Dunkley called Parallax. Actually, no, it is too big for that. <laughs> but um, we will yeah. investigate that. And we've got a, a few questions. These ones all came in recently, and I must have. I've got a confession to make, uh, and my wife's going to hate my guts for saying this. But uh, the other day, she was telling me how she cleaned out her Gmail account. I said, oh, mine's got 14,000 emails in it. <laughs> what do you reckon? She said, give it here. And she went, click, click, click. I said, but I don't want to lose all my questions from Space Nuts. And she went, what? <laughs> guess what happened? Oh, well, that's all right. They Good. were all vanquished. <laughs> all vanquished. I um, spent a couple of days um, Googling all the ways and means of getting everything back, and I actually succeeded which was oh, quite, quite surprising. But not only did I succeed in getting those ones back, I got all the ones that we've already done over the last three years. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Never mind, that's all right. Oh, dear. You've got to love technology until it breaks. Anyway, let's get on with the business of the day, and that is the remarkable journey of Voyager 2, Not which, notwithstanding the wonderful journey of Voyager 1, but it's got a broken bit. That's why Voyager 2 is uh, a little bit more interesting in terms of, uh, of its recent achievement. Let's, um, where is it exactly? It's so many gazillion miles away, uh, 119.7 astronomical units would be my guess. But um, yeah, what, what's the latest? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it is uh, 119.7 astronomical unit. An astronomical unit. What a unit coincidence! Is, That's what I it, thought. Is the is the distance, the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, which is 150 million kilometres. Wow. Uh, or as I used to say when I was a kid, is it 93 million miles? I think it's 90. It might, might be 92. Anyway, about 90-ish million miles. Yeah. But 150 million kilometres, since we all use kilometres. Well, in this country these days, uh, but, um, it, you know, it, it's a staggering distance. Uh, it's actually not as far as <laughs> not as far as Voyager 1, which is the most remote human made uh, object. Uh, which Voyager 1's a little bit further along the track. But Voyager 2 is about 17 billion kilometers from the sun. Um, and why is it in the news? Because it has just crossed the helio the helio sheath. The helio uh, sheath. Yes, the helio sheath is. Uh, uh, th- I've heard a, of the helio pause because I saw yeah, I saw that yeah. in a doco once about Voyager One's journey. 
Yeah. And now so Voyager 2 what is... we're talking about basically is the boundary between the uh, the sun's magnetic field and the interstellar magnetic field. And it, it, it's not just a simple boundary, it's complicated. So there is a heliopause, that's the transition, but there is also a heliosheath, which oh. I think is a, I think is the part on the sort of leading edge of the of the sun's field of magnetic uh, magnetic field of influence. Might be wrong there, but I think that's what it is. <laughs> good enough for me, Fred. <laughs> yeah, it sounds good, doesn't it? There's, so um, actually, there's something else too, which I think is further further in towards the sun, and that's the termination shock. Uh, and I have to say, I'm you know my knowledge of um, uh, particularly magnetic physics in in the interstellar medium is not as detailed as it could be, and so these terms are ones that probably mean as much to me as they do to you but basically they mean the edge uh, there at the at the edge of the sun's magnetic magnetic influence now just one thing to 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 preface this discussion with is that they're not at the edge of the sun's gravitational influence because gravity goes on forever yeah. uh, and um, there are objects which are bound to the sun which are much much further out than either of the voyages are and these are comets um, there is a, a cloud of cometary debris which uh, circulates around the sun it's called the Oort cloud and it's a lot further away from the sun than we're talking about now uh, oh. but the, those uh, comets uh, exist in a whilst they you know they're, they're connected to the sun gravitationally they are actually orbiting the sun but in the interstellar medium so they're they're, they're not connected magnetically to the sun wow yeah i, I forgot about the Oort cloud i mean we we it, it's very hard to think in terms of the enormity of what we're discussing sometimes, that just the massive size of the things around us that uh, you can see and look through and, and, and witness, but it, you just don't get it. <laughs> and yeah. the only way to get it is to get out there and look back. And <laughs> we haven't really had too many options, opportunities to do that. You could also get it by reading, um, you know, a science fiction novel by Andrew Dunkley called Parallax. Parallax that would do or, it. Or you could do, uh, you could read a book called Cosmic Chronicles by, by oh, Fred that's, Watson, which that's also rubbish. Would, that is. Oh, it's rubbish. <laughs> 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 not not only is it rubbish, it's going to have no. It's not rubbish at all. No, it's a very it good book. Uh, it's going to have a different title in the rest of the English speaking world because the American oh. publisher, Columbia University Press. Uh, thought that the original title here in Australia of Cosmic Chronicles wasn't exciting enough, so uh, everywhere else in the world it'll be called Exploding Stars and Invisible Planets. There's a really old one um, by another author called Cosmic Barnacles. It's really boring. <laughs> it's <laughs> very slow. Um, back to Voyager 2. Yeah, yeah. How did we get onto that? Oh, by goodness. the way, those books are available on the Space Nuts website via just, our shop. I didn't even know that. Funnily <laughs> enough. Yeah. Um, I yeah, Voyager 2 is fascinating because it's been able to offer us some information um, now that it's crossed that that threshold that we were talking about. And it, it did something that Voyager 1 couldn't because it had a broken bit as far as I understand. Yeah, that's right. So, so um, the, you know, Voyager 2 is, uh, it's got it, all its faculties still operating. Uh, it, what it's done is measured the plasma density. That's the density of these ionized particles, particles that have been, uh, you know, d denuded of their electrons. Um, and the re really interesting bit is that this, this, plasma density when you leave the sun's field of influence it actually goes up it jumps upwards hugely mm. uh, and you might expect it to be the other way around uh, because the sun's a relatively nearby object it's streaming out these um uh you know these high uh, the, the particles the solar wind uh and you might think that the solar wind uh having its source nearby would be much denser than the than the interstellar wind, if I can put it that way, the, the plasma that's caused by interstellar space. Uh, but the reason why it's the other way around, and it actually is the other way around by a factor of 20 in this case, the measured values are actually, um, uh, you know, a, a factor of 20 different. Uh, in fact, I, I, can, I can give you the numbers. I might just do that. And yeah. this is particle density uh, in, in the 
uh, our side of the of the heliopause that's the, the as we said earlier the boundary between the two uh, it, it's about 0 0.002 particles per cubic centimeter so that means you know you've got much less than one particle per cc but on the other side it jumps up to almost 0 0.04 particles uh, per cubic centimeter and what's that what that's telling you is that there are 20 times as many particles beyond the boundary as there are on this side of the boundary and it comes about because their their effective temperature of that uh, you know that solar wind is much lower sorry that interstellar wind is much lower its temperature is lower and that increases the density of the particles as you as temperature goes up the density decreases uh, so that the, the the temperature of the solar wind if i can put it that way is much higher than the temperature of the uh, interstellar magnetic uh, on the interstellar particle flux um, so yes interesting stuff what's also interesting i think about this is that when Voyager 1 crossed this boundary in a completely different part direction, because I think Voyager 1 went to the north of the equator and Voyager 2 to the south, I think I'm right in saying that, it might be the other way around, but they are different. Um, so because the sun's magnetic field of influence, certainly in this direction, is roughly spherical, you'd expect uh, these two distances from the sun when it crosses, when the spacecraft cross the boundary, to be more or less the same. And indeed they are. Uh, slightly different, but not very not very different. So we've just seen Voyager 2 cross, in fact, it's not just is the wrong word, it's actually about a year ago, but this is, you know, the results that are being analysed. Yeah. Uh, we've seen it cross the heliopause at a distance as, as exactly as you said of 119.7 astronomical units. Six years ago, Voyager 1 did the same trick in a different direction, uh, and the distance there was 122.6 astronomical units. So they're really relatively small differences uh, in the, um, you, you know, in, in where they cross uh, in terms of the distance from the sun. Uh, I think that's quite remarkable. It, it tells you that this region around the sun, uh, certainly at this point, is roughly spherical, mm. uh, and it's good to, you know, good to have the uh, all the the theoretical predictions uh, actually uh, basically demonstrated by these measurements. I wonder what Gary Flandro would think of it all. I don't know. Why don't you ask him? I, is he still around? <laughs> Isn't he the guy that thought of the idea of sending the voyages out there because he um, realised the alignment was The alignment correct. of the planets, yeah. I'm not sure about uh, the, the identity of that person, um, but I, I uh, trust you to have found, found that name from a reliable source and not just a science fiction novel called Parallax or something like that. No, it's um, not in there. No. But, um, but, but I think it was him. Uh, there was yeah. also another fellow who headed up the project, uh, Harris Shermeyer. And uh, I, I, uh, he, is, he has passed away, so, um, uh, but he probably was around long enough to understand the ramifications of the missions because they did what they were designed to do, but then they kept on going yeah, and, they going did, right. and going yeah. and going. <laughs> and, and so that, you know, the Voyager project has been extended by NASA about 10 times, I think, yes. because uh, uh, originally it was just a four year mission and just to remind uh, uh, Space Nuts listeners, 1977, I think, was the year that the spacecraft were launched. Uh, Voyager 2 was launched before Voyager 1. Um, and Voyager 1's mission uh, involved flybys of Jupiter and Saturn, but Voyager 2 included those two and Uranus and Neptune as well. And it was exactly as you said, it was a few individuals who realized that if you were quick about it, you could get a spacecraft off, off into the wide blue yonder, then you could take advantage of the alignment of these um, of these planets and use the, the the ones that you're flying by as gravitational slingshots. So you push them on further out into the solar system. Yeah, Gary uh, Arnold Flandro was the one who made that discovery. And very good. Uh, it was sort of a a back room concept that became something super extraordinary. Yeah, and still and is. It is. I, I, they're sort of magical machines, really. Uh, just to uh, kind of tie up one other loose end, they both are powered by radioisotope thermal generator, um, thermoelectric generators, RTGs, uh, which uh, have a limited lifetime um, as the power 
gradually falls away from the heat that these bags of or the boxes of plutonium are providing, uh, the in various instruments, non-critical instruments, will be switched off as time goes on. Um, and at the end, uh, we will only have telecommunications, just telemetry going between the Earth and the spacecraft. Uh, but we don't expect that to happen until round about 2032. So mm. there's still life in the old spacecraft yet, and yeah. we... Hope we'll hear more about them as they venture into space. Uh, you know, at their it's roughly, I think their speed is of the order of 17 kilometers per second or thereabouts, uh, and uh, they'll keep on going probably forever. Fantastic, yeah. They could probably recharge by doing a flyby of Chernobyl or something. <laughs> that might work. <laughs> All right, uh, more to learn, I'm sure, from Voyagers 1 and 2. But, uh, yes, a milestone again reached by Voyager 2 recently and the data coming back is so very intriguing. You're listening to Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Now, let's take a little break and find out more about our sponsor, Express VPN, rated number one by Tech Radar. Uh, this is the one I use. I've been using it for a couple of years and I love it. When I joined Express VPN, they were, they were brand new, uh, new to the market, but uh, I read a lot of reviews and did a lot of comparisons. And there was just something about their, their business model that I particularly liked. And a couple of years down the track, honestly, can't complain. Their interface is very easy to use. Their, their service is second to none. Uh, I've had to contact them a couple of times about um, certain things that I wanted to do and they were brilliant. So you may be wondering why I do need a VPN at all. It's all about privacy. Uh, do you really want big tech companies, governments and others knowing uh, what's going on with your online activity? Even if you're having nothing to hide, it just feels downright creepy. Uh, I think you'll agree. And governments are getting more and more interested in what you're doing every day. And so, yeah, protecting your privacy is what VPN is all about. And how often do you uh, run across websites that you want to get information from only to find that they're geo-blocked? This is becoming an increasing problem, but ExpressVPN solves that problem for you. Uh, now, if you go to our special URL, you'll see quite a list of things this service can help you with, things you may never have thought of before. As I say, it's the one I use, secure, fast, and it just works. Uh, so protect yourself online today and find out more about how to get three months free at tryexpressvpn.com slash space. That's T-R-Y-E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash space for three months free with a one-year package. Try expressvpn.com slash space to learn more and you'll find the link details in the show notes and on our website. Now... Back to the show. Okay, we checked all four systems and team with a go. Space Nuts. Okay, welcome back. And a big hello to all our followers on the Space Nuts podcast group on Facebook. Hey, I got it right. That doesn't mean I'll get it right again. But uh, thank you for following us there. We, we get a few people joining the group uh, every day, I notice. And it's a pleasure to have you all aboard, whether you listen or read or both. Uh, but a lot of the stuff we talk about ends up on the podcast group Facebook page. So if you're not a member of the Space Nuts podcast group, just look it up on your Facebook search engine and join us. We'd be happy to have you along. Um, I occasionally partake in conversation. Um, Fred's not a Facebook user, which is probably the safest way to be, Fred. <laughs> yeah. It's, Never... it's fun yeah. but addictive. Yeah. Mm. Now, let's move on to our, our next uh, topic, and that is the, um, the, the black hole, maybe, uh, which could be the lowest mass black hole yet discovered at, uh, what, 3.3 times the mass of our sun, which isn't super massive at all, really, when you think about it. Uh, it's not. That's, co that's quite correct. Um, so uh, it, it, this is a very interesting you know, it's a, a very interesting uh, set of observations that have um, basically arrived at this conclusion that what we found, or what astronomers have found, is the smallest yet known black hole. But it might be the biggest yet known neutron star. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here um, we go. 
Yeah, the potato <laughs> potato. <laughs> Well, it's always, you know, <laughs> there's always caveats in these things. Um, so let, let's just review um, what we know about black holes. Um, they come in basically two classes, the supermassive black holes, which are things with masses millions or billion times the mass of the sun, which sit at the centers of galaxies. And they've probably grown that size by gobbling up lots and lots of debris and material uh, that have surrounded them over the maybe 12 or 13 billion years that they've been in existence. But then there's the what we call stellar mass black holes. These are black holes with masses which are greater than the mass of the sun, but sort of typical of, of some massive stars. Uh, and uh, those um, we, we understand have masses in the range typically of about five to 15 times the mass of our sun. Um, they might be bigger than that. Some of, some of them are uh, probably bigger. In fact, we know some of them are bigger because the gravitational uh, wave experiments that have been done by the LIGO detector uh, and Virgo, its counterpart in, in Italy, um, they've shown collisions with objects uh, involving mergers of black holes, which are perhaps 20, 30 times the mass of the sun. So relatively big. Uh, but, but the smaller ones, um, 5 to 15 times the mass of the sun, are revealing themselves actually by their X radiation. And so what you, what you have, and this is a fairly common... Um, phenomenon throughout our galaxy. By that, I mean, we know of, I, I don't know, I suppose a few dozen of these things. I might, I, I'm not an X-ray astronomer, so I might be exaggerating there. But certainly the very first one, Cygnus X1, works by this mechanism. Uh, if you have two stars, um, one of which, uh, and, and they get to the ends of their lives, one of which is massive enough that when it blows up in, as a supernova, it actually, its core collapses into a black hole. If you've got that phenomenon and, and another a companion star in orbit around it, if that companion star is close enough, then you'll get material sucked off the companion star, which will uh, go into the black hole of the accretion, sorry, the accretion disk of the black hole. This is the spinning disk of material around the black hole. And that's where the X-rays come from, because there's so much energy in this uh, spinning disk of material, uh, the particles banging together, they actually create X-rays. And so you get a very strong X-ray source, plus the fact that there are uh, these beams of, of uh, material being spurted out from the poles of the black hole by the, the fact that it's highly magnetized. So uh, that's the way that black holes, these stellar mass black holes, five to 15 times the mass of the sun, that's the way that they have mostly been discovered. But a, um, a, a group of uh, scientists, uh, if I remember rightly, they are mostly in the United States, yes, at the Ohio State University um, in the US. Uh, they've uh, thought slightly outside the box about this and said, what if we're missing something here? What if um, there are some uh, black holes in orbits around or with, with other stars orbiting around them which are not close enough to have this transfer of material from the companion star down to the black hole's accretion disk. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't see any X-rays. You would not know that there was, um, you know, that there was a, a, an X-ray source there. You wouldn't know that there was a black hole there. That's probably what I'm trying to say, uh, because there's no X-rays being produced. And so what they've done is they've done what uh, the, the planet hunters do. They've looked at the way stars which are visible uh, in the sky, and they're relatively faint, but big telescopes can detect them, uh, look at the way that they, they move with um, the, what's called the Doppler effect, the fact that uh, as a star comes towards us or goes away from us, we can pick up its motion by means of the device we call a spectrograph which breaks the light up into that rainbow of colors with the with the barcode of elements uh, signatures imprinted on it um, so you use one of those and you look for slight variations in the the velocity of the star which you can measure by means of the spectrograph uh, and if you if you do that uh, over a long period of time you can see the motion of the star which is caused by something orbiting around it. And that's how we detect 
planets. It's called the Doppler wobble method. We've yeah. talked about it many times before. But you can kind of invert that. You can look at the way a star's velocity is changing, and then you can infer from that that it may well be in orbit itself around something highly massive because mm -hmm. you can do the geometrical you know analysis of this sort of thing and that's what these astronomers have done uh, they have detected something uh, about three times the mass of the sun that's the large star itself being tugged backwards and forwards by its companion object once every 83 days and but that companion object has a mass of probably uh 3.3 to, to maybe even as much as six times the mass of the sun. And the fact that it's invisible, uh, uh, because all you see is the star going around it, uh, suggests that that is a black hole. It's the fact that it's compact as well. Uh, so we've got here the first evidence that there are, there are there is a class of objects that we haven't seen before, black holes, uh, which are in that maybe three to five solar mass range uh, where you don't get x-ray uh, you know x-ray emission from from the, the material around the black hole but you've got other evidence to suggest that it's there uh, so this is an interesting piece of research uh, that may lead to a whole new field of study in, in black hole physics yeah. um, what were they, they, there's a, I was just going to say there's a there's a term for them. They're being called non-interacting black holes. That's to say, black holes that don't interact with their companion stars. Okay, because we did talk. You mentioned at the beginning there there were two classes of black hole: the supermassive and the you know the smaller variety. These yeah. are possibly smaller. Smaller uh, still. We always thought there was, you know, why wasn't there anything middle-sized? And we've started yeah. to discover. Well, there are. Yeah, it seems. And now we're finding even smaller ones. So yeah. it's starting to look like they might come in all sizes. Yeah, in all shapes and sizes. I have to say that, that the intermediate mass black holes, as they're called, things with a mass of 100 or 1,000 uh, suns, uh, those are still very much in the minority. There are one or two that are that, that are candidates for those objects. Um, but there's still a, a big gap between the black holes that we can detect by X-rays and the black holes we detect in the centre of galax centres of galaxies. Those are there's, there's a big gap in there of um, you know missing intermediate mass black holes. That's a problem that I don't think has yet been solved. Uh, but this in in some ways adds to the mystery because it says well you can get even smaller ones as well um, that aren't interacting with their companion stars. Yeah, it is fascinating uh, and so much more to learn. Um... We'll crack it one day. It might take a long time. Uh, I, I wondered, though, while you were talking, if there have been discoveries in astronomy, where, uh, in astronomy in the past where people have sat down and gone, now, wait a minute. We're looking at it from this perspective. What if it's something else? And they've started looking into it and gone, voila. Has that happened much? Yeah. <laughs> I was happen like that all the time. <laughs> I mean, often, um, so... You know, the, uh, the perhaps the classic example of that is that uh, goes back to the 19th century when an uh, astronomer called Le Verrier um, believed that uh, because of a peculiarity in the motion of, mo of Mercury around the sun, he believed that there was a, a planet um, between the sun and Mercury. And that was commonly accepted for 50 years, that there was a planet. It was called Vulcan. Nobody had ever seen it. People had tried to observe it. A couple of people thought they'd seen it, but it, it was never there. But it was just assumed by astronomers that, that uh, it was a real object. And it was only when Einstein put together his general theory of relativity and found that the fact that uh, gravity behaves a little bit differently when you're really close to the sun than Newton, Newton predicted, uh, that uh, then accounts for the uh, observed anomalies in Mercury's orbit. And as soon as you put relativity into the thing, the need for Vulcan just disappears. Mm. Uh, it, it, was a, it was a complete red herring. And who's to know? Uh, we might be following other red herrings in astronomy today. And, you know, people might look at, uh, Space Nuts podcasts in 20 years' time and fall about laughing because we were missing the point so much. Yeah, probably Planet Nine. Yeah, there's all that as well. That's yeah. right. Yes. Yeah. All right. Very good. You're listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Andrew Dunkley here with Fred Watson. Zero G and I feel 
Space Nuts. Thank you again to our patrons who have joined us on Patreon and uh, putting their money where our podcast is. Uh, we really do appreciate your support. And if you would like to do the same, uh, patreon.com slash space nuts is where you go. And um, just yeah, choose your poison, basically. <laughs> uh, patreon.com slash space nuts if you would like to contribute to the show. And uh, another way you can contribute is by following us on YouTube, uh, where, um, well, nearly 600 people have now started following the Space Nuts um, YouTube channel, which is fantastic. Actually, it just clicked over 601 as I spoke, Fred. So that is wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful news. So thank you very much for your support of our, um, our podcast. Now, let's nail down some questions, shall we, Fred? Um, this one comes from Robert Gola. Uh, hi, Robert. I just recently discovered your podcast and have enjoyed listening to all episodes. You mustn't have listened to any yet. Uh, uh, the ones you could find. They're all on YouTube, Robert, and just you can press play all and it, it, you don't have to worry. Then they'll just go. Uh, he says uh, he's got a question. It's a very long one. Uh, given that the planets in our solar system tend to rotate on their axes in the same sense as they revolve around the sun, e.g. anti-clockwise when viewed from the North Pole. It seems that those objects that don't do that, like Uranus, are assumed to have had some dramatic thing happen in their past. Now, moving out in scale, our sun revolves around the centre of the Milky Way. However, the planetary orbits of our solar system are tilted with respect to the plane of the Milky Way. One can see this because the path of the planets across the sky uh, do not coincide with the band of the Milky Way. So, my question is, does this mean that something dramatic happened in the formation of our solar system to tilt it on its axis of rotation with respect to the plane of the Milky Way, or is it simply wrong to assume that the sense of rotation of the Milky Way could be imparted on the developing solar system since it is so far away from the centre of rotation and relatively small in size? <gasps> I hope that was some way understandable. Actually, I know exactly what you're saying. It, it, it is a great question and, um, yeah, well well presented. Indeed, that's right. And, and actually, um, uh, Robert's got the answer in there as well. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Next question. Uh, so um, the, it's quite right that the, you know, the, the, the planets all rotate uh, a big pan revolve around the sun in in one plane effectively it's not quite but it's m much the same uh, plane um, and that plane is tilted over at a very steep angle it's almost 90 degrees to the plane of our galaxy the, the disk of the galaxy uh, but um, the, the the reason why that isn't necessarily attributed to some dramatic event tipping over the solar system is because of the well it's part there are two things one is that the solar system is absolutely mil, minuscule on the size of the galaxy so uh, if you think of the galaxy as this big swirling disk of stars uh, the solar system is almost invisible on that scale um, and you know behaves like a, effectively a single point in terms of the gravitational field of the of the galaxy let me just give you um, an illustration of that which i used to use a lot and i've kind of forgotten about until recently when i thought yeah that's this is a fantastic illustration if you imagine a picture of our galaxy a beautiful disk of stars and gas and dust nice big portrait that you can put on your wall maybe the galaxy's a meter across or something like that and now instead of it being a meter a meter across think of that picture uh, of our galaxy having the diameter of the earth um, you know twelve and a half thousand kilometers so what is the separation of the earth and the sun on that scale and the answer is two millimeters oh and so that kind of gives you you know the scale of a solar system compared with the scale of the galaxy um, and so as far as the galaxy is concerned the solar system is just a single point mm. um, the other thing is that there's a you know the the galaxy itself uh, assumed its its disk-like shape probably 12 or so billion years ago 
When our sun and the solar system only formed 4.6 billion years ago by the collapse of a, of a gas cloud that really itself was just, you know, the size of a particle compared with the size of the galaxy. So the, the, the dynamics of the two are really relatively independent. The galaxy, whilst it's true that the solar system does orbit around the centre of our galaxy, it's not sort of gravitationally uh, constrained by it in the sense that all solar systems are parallel to the, you know, to the rotation of the galaxy. So that, they, that you can regard them as being pretty independent in terms of the way their rotation has come about. But it's a great question. Thank mm. you very much for that, Robert. So it just is what it is, basically. Yeah. So, so what what Robert says is is it that um, you know that the, the solar system is so far from the centre of rotation and relatively small in size? That's exactly it. Okay. Very good. Thanks, Robert. Uh, we'll move on to our next question from Philip Eggert uh, in Germany. Hello, Philip. Uh, I've got a cousin over in Germany at the moment. Uh, first of all, I love your podcast. I always listen in the car while driving uh, back and forth from Germany to the Netherlands. Wow, that's a heck of a trip. Or maybe it's not. It just depends where you are, I suppose. <laughs> uh, I've got a question for you guys. Uh, when I heard a question from your last podcast about potential multiverses affecting each other through gravity, I thought about the possibility that instead of just bouncing against each other, like it is explained in many theories, they would merge. I know this is a very theoretical question with probably no definite answer, but I thought maybe you guys have your own thoughts on that. Hope you consider my question. I'm looking forward to your next episode, next podcast. Thank you, Philip. Uh, well, we thought it was worth tackling right now. <laughs> yeah, we did. That's right. So um, there, there isn't really, I don't think there is a straightforward answer to this because the, the idea of multiverse, of um, you know, more than one universe, it doesn't really fit uh, the standard model of the universe. So uh, the, the model we all accept is based on Einstein's theory of relativity, says that the universe exists in three dimensions of space and one of time, and that it basically has, a, has had a lifetime of about 13.8 billion years. And that there was nothing before it because time itself started with the universe, with the Big Bang. So that's the kind of standard model. Now, beyond that, uh, everything is hypothesis. Uh, and there are a, a lot of very serious cosmologists and uh, astrophysicists who have looked in detail at this and have probably built theoretical frameworks. Um, we spoke about one uh, I don't know, last week or the week before, Roger Penrose, who's one of those astrophysicists who imagines that, that the universe, uh, the multiverse really itself is just a single entity that incorporates um, subunits uh, which form from black holes and of which our universe is just one. Um, but another way of looking at it is to suggest that there is perhaps um, a, 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 a higher dimensional space beyond the dimensions we can see uh, in uh, what's it called in I forgot what it's called in um, uh, in uh, Doctor Who they've got a name for it um, which I think might be the void, is it? I can't remember. Uh, the, the, there is a technical term for it as well, which is slightly different. <laughs> I've forgotten that too. So terrible. I should go and look these things up again before I start talking about them. Uh, no, it's called a bulk. That's See it. how I saved you there? Yeah. Uh, did you? Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the bulk is the, uh, the region outside normal space and time. And if that exists, for example, a fifth, you know, fifth dimension, something of that sort, then it's not easy to see how if you've got um, standard universes wandering around in this bulk or the void, as it's called in, in Doctor Who, uh, what, how they would interact. Would they bounce off one another? Would they merge? Uh, we, we don't know. There's one theory, the only theory that I've really looked at in any detail, and it's a long time ago since I looked at it. This is the ekpyrotic theory that suggests that if, OK, you, you can imagine... Uh, universes, um, just for the sake of argument, compressed into two dimensions. So they're they're in in planes. So a universe is sitting in something like a sheet of paper. It's got a name. It's called a brain, and a brain is an abbreviation for a membrane. Um, that uh, those brains could perhaps collide, uh, and the 
uh, idea of those collisions uh, would be, or the idea of the ekpyrotic theory, is that collisions between two membranes or brains would actually generate a big bang phenomenon mm. uh, and give you the expanding universe. Now, there's a lot of theory involved in that, which I'm not really party to because I've not looked at the mathematics, and if, even if I did, I probably wouldn't understand most of them. But um, that suggests that uh, that there is a kind of amalgamation, there's an interaction between multiverses that actually sparks, um, you know, an event, a big bang event. So what it's saying is maybe not merging, but certainly doing a bit more than just bouncing off one another, perhaps, you know, interacting with one another in a significant way. So I think Philip's thinking on the right lines, um, but uh, I'm sorry, I can't fill in too many of the details, but I think it's, you know, it's a, it's a really good, interesting idea. Yes, indeed. Uh, and look, one that'll bounce around in people's brains forever, and we may never be able to solve that one. It's just, yeah, I don't mean, how, how do you observe another universe within this one which is so vast and uh, unless they come up with some new concepts yeah, and theories we, i'm sure there'll be clever people who find a way <laughs> maybe so maybe so we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll we will see uh, now uh moving oh and thank you very much uh, philip for your question um ralph haney uh has a question from petaluma in california i hope i pronounced that correctly now this is a really really long question he goes into some deep explanation about the fabric of time and uh, he's been struggling lately with the concept uh, i spent many evenings in our dark backyard observing our planet's rotation away from our star the darkness of space filling my sky overhead the distant light of other suns slowly revealing themselves You've been writing a book or something. This is really nice. <laughs> Very poetic. I, ta yeah. I take special note of the relationship of our spinning orb in relation to Polaris and the ecliptic with Jupiter, Saturn and our moon, trying to tangibly experience it in an objective off-planet perspective to grasp the big picture. Sometimes I succeed and it's astounding. So he goes on to say, we're a small sphere spinning like crazy, orbiting a local star, being exposed repeatedly to direct energy, then blocked from it by our own mass day and night take on a new meaning with this greater perspective. Uh, but time is an, enig uh, an enigma. We experience it as a linear phenomenon, always moving forward, never stopped and never reversing. As such, the starlight we receive in our night sky, even our own solar system's planet's reflected starlight, is always historical. Makes sense. But given that, how can we possibly plan a rendezvous with a distant object like Alpha Proximus or even Mars when the objects are no longer where we see them? How does NASA do this? Is it entirely by way of projections with supercomputers? And furthermore, is if the nearest galaxy Andromeda is so far away, how do we know it still exists? I know the theory of relativity makes a strong case for the fabric of time, but my feeble brain has a hard time pulling it all together. Truly, time is enigmatic. Love the show, Ralph Haney. That's a brilliant question just so well put together yeah it is it's and, and it is you know it's very um a very articulate question yes, as well indeed. if i may say so but look, uh, basically but, um, what he's saying is with everything moving uh, all the time and being so far away from us how on earth do we know where things are or even, even if they still are there yeah and so, sometimes they're not um that's right but uh to, 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 you know, often we we know where they are, even if they're not where we thought they were. If I can put it that way, um, let's just go. There are there are really two questions here. One is about rendezvous with um, with uh, objects in the solar system, and that's really pretty straightforward because you, um, as soon as you know the orbital parameters of a planet, for example, uh, then you can build in the fact that. Uh, the light travel time from that planet is, um, you know, however many seconds uh, multiplied by the speed of light. Uh, sorry, I've got that the other way around. It's the distance divided by the speed of light. That that that's the tra that, so it, it works. Um, it works really well. And and I, my my experience of this goes back to when I used to work. And this is 
you know, many, many years ago uh, when I used to work on the orbits of asteroids uh, was what I did for my master's degree. And in, in all the equations where you're looking at the positions of asteroids, you always have, or when you're relating them to observations from the Earth, you always put in a term that involves the speed of light. There's the, the, the you know, a, 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 a delay factor uh, caused by the fact that the light travel time uh, is not zero. There's always a travel time. And that actually works very well. And it's how we basically how we steer things around the solar system. Um, likewise, with anything in our galaxy, if we were, you know, if we had spacecraft that could travel at close to the speed of light and we were trying to rendezvous with uh, the, the nearby stars around the sun, like uh, I think actually what uh, Ralph means is Proxima Centauri, uh, which is the nearest star to the to the uh, the solar system then we could do the same thing because the motions of stars around the sun are pretty well known they're pretty well established and once you know that then you can c compensate for their motion when you do a rendezvous but the bigger question is about whether you know how do we know whether distant objects still exist um andromeda certainly will uh andromeda is only two million light years away exactly as ralph says uh, that's that, you know that's very much on our doorstep in terms of uh, the, the the world of uh, space, or if I can put it that way, um, it will exist, and uh, you can you know we kind of could work out its position if we we're ever going to try and travel there. I don't think that's really on the cards at the moment. Um, in um, for more distant objects, the, the, the bottom line is when you're looking at the universe as a whole. The only way we have of getting any information about the universe is by virtue of things that travel at the speed of light, either radio waves or X-rays or whatever they are, they're all coming at the speed of light. And so, in a, in a sense, the universe itself only exists um, in this relative dimension. We we can imagine, so, you know, okay, let's imagine looking at the universe as a whole from the outside and what's happening, are things coming into or going out of existence, that might be the case. But none of that has any meaning to an astrophysicist because everything comes to us by virtue of, of things being transmitted at the speed of light or sometimes a little bit less in the case of subatomic particles. So um, we always uh, envisage or think of the universe in terms of what we can actually see. And it may well be true that some distant objects aren't there anymore. In fact, I, you know, there's a classic example of this. Quasars in the modern universe are extinct. We don't see them uh, in the in the modern day universe. But as we look back in time, we see these objects. They're actually delinquent galaxies. They're the nuclei of galaxies that have got a hyperactive black hole in the middle doing all sorts of things to their surroundings. But they they don't seem to exist in today's universe. So if you think of the universe as a whole, then there aren't any quasars in it. But we see them ten a penny because because we're always looking back in time. I don't know whether that helps, but that is the way the world of astrophysics looks at things. There you are, Ralph. Easy. <laughs> uh, thanks for your question. Really appreciate it. And uh, we appreciate all your questions and all the activity on Facebook and uh, just some of the, the comments. We, we did actually get a nice comment uh, the other day, Fred. I meant to mention it this, uh, this episode. And I'll see if I can find it very quickly. Uh, yeah, from um, calls himself Jabber. Jabber Steady. Uh, loving your work, guys. Great to listen while lazing by the pool. <laughs> so people can listen anywhere, oh, anytime. Yeah. It's the beauty yeah. of podcasts. Um, now, before I let you go, Fred, uh, a reminder to everybody that there is a Space Nuts shop. You can find it on our official website, bytes.com slash Space Nuts. That's B-I-T-E-S-Z. Apparently the proper way of spelling it was taken. Uh, B-I-T-E-S-Z dot com slash Space Nuts. You can listen to all our episodes there. You can sort of slide down and there's Cosmic Chronicles and a couple of other uh, books by Fred. Why is Uranus upside down? It must have been something he ate. Uh, and Fred Watson's Star Craving Mad and a few other very questionable publications. But uh, there's T-shirts there as well with the Space Nuts logo. Lots of people asking how to get hold of T-shirts. So that's where you go. Bytes.com slash Space Nuts. Fred, thank you as always. Uh, great fun again. 
Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, great fun to talk to you too. And, um, you know, maybe we should do it again sometime. I, I'm thinking we might do it in a millennia or two. <laughs> millennium or two. A, a, a millennium. No, yeah, a week could be better. Yeah, OK, we'll do that. All right, let's do that. <laughs> thanks, Red. See you soon. See you later. Bye for now. And thanks for listening. Thanks for being a part of the Space, Space Nuts crew. It's always good to have you involved. And we look forward to joining you again next time on another edition of Space Nuts. Space Nuts. You've been listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Subscribe to the full podcast on iTunes and Stitcher or your favourite podcast distributor. This has been another quality podcast production from Sites.com.